Last summer, I fairly choked to death on smoke from the fires in Arizona and then in Los Alamos. In Taos County, the Carson National Forest was closed for many weeks because of drought and fire danger. This has become a common summertime occurrence in our county. I remember when I moved to Taos in 1969, I would climb our high mountains and I'd see pollution everywhere, much of it originating from the Four Corners uh, area power plants. However, the Taos climate was still pretty cool back then. I recall that when it was 93 degrees in Albuquerque, it would be only around 80 degrees in Taos, no more. And I appreciated that because I really hate heat. Unfortunately, that mild Taos climate of the early 1970s is now history. 95 degrees in Burke can often translate as 90 degrees or more in Taos. Nowadays, when you can fry an egg on the sidewalk in Albuquerque's old town, you can also fry an egg on the sidewalk in front of the Taos Walmart. So what's the point of even living here anymore? I can't stand our current summers. I might as well move to Alaska, but then I'd have to deal with mosquitoes and the black flies. Or I could just move to Phoenix or Yuma, Arizona get it over with quickly because then at least I wouldn't be crucified by the cold weather of winter. <laughs> to compound my recent summer problems, I've never had a home air conditioner, God forbid. I never needed one and I am not that much of an enviro philistine anyway. Also, I had never even punched the air conditioner button in my car until last summer when I finally relented and touched that forbidden button on a trip to Rancho de Taos, four miles south of here. I mean, I'm sorry, I consider myself a serious echo-Nazi. I hate Freon like I hated George Bush, but it was really hot. <laughs> Yet when I pressed in that air conditioner button, I felt as if I was killing the canary in the coal mine. Or to use another dramatic metaphor, I felt as if I was the reactionary president of America, punching the red panic button to launch a missile attack on the Soviet Union. I mean, symbolically. My act of finally touching that air conditioner button in my car seemed to transform me into Slim Pickens riding a bomb down toward Armageddon <laughs> instead of remaining a 69-year-old fart with a heart condition piloting a 1993 Toyota Corolla south toward the trading post for lunch during another spate of global warming in Taos. That had finally tipped me over the edge like Steven Seagal and hard to kill, or Michael Douglas in that Hollywood revenge fantasy of a good guy going berserk in a traffic jam, falling down. Yes, I did it, Ralph Nader, <laughs> Wendell Berry, Helen Caldicott, Al Gore, etc. I activated my fucking automobile air conditioner, suck on that, and learn to live with it. <laughs> However, the mention of global warming brings me finally to what I've been asked to do this evening, which is to introduce tonight's serious entertainment, the noted writer, historian, conservationist, and environmental activist, William Dubuis. Bill is a man after my own heart. Like me, he has an infectious smile that makes him always appear to be cheerful and innocent and harmless, like a fox. And he moved to New Mexico from back east, and he embraced our state. He writes about it, which gives us a common history to boot. Two, Bill has been through traumatic divorce proceedings, though not as many of them, apparently, as I have. <laughs> Still, we've both written about our marital screw-ups, although Bill is way more discreet in that realm than me. And I feel that makes us almost like Red Brothers in the bond. Unlike me, Bill is a man who loves horses. I am afraid of horses. They are much too big for me, and they have teeny-weeny delicate little ankles. 
Loving horses did not mean that people can't shoot them, however, right between the eyes when they are old and dying. And his description of this act of mercy in his memoir, The Walk, is one of the more riveting and startling and ultimately loving passages I've ever read in literature. The Walk is a marvelous book. Du Bois' memoir, River of Traps, was a well-deserved finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in the early 1990s. And his stirring 1999 pain to Southern California's desert water follies called Salt Dreams, Land of Water in Low Down California, is a moving precursor to his most recent book, just published, which I finished reading a couple of months ago. It is called A Great Aridness, Climate Change, and the Future of the Southwest. You could say that a great aridness is where William de Buys has been headed all along. And if you truly wish to understand where we, humanity, are headed in an environmental handcart, and how we got into that handcart in the first place, and the, what's going to happen when the handcart reaches hell, you will want and need to read A Great Aridness. De Buys calls our climate situation in the Southwest and on Earth a train wreck, and then he patiently leads us by the hand down the track toward the inevitable conclusion of the train wreck. His book is a vast and important history of the Southwest. It is great political, cultural, human, and natural history. It's also a compassionate and prophetic polemic. I believe a great aridness will come to be known as one of the seminal works about human folly and environmental disaster written in our country. It belongs alongside books like Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, Barry Commoner's The Closing Circle, Bill McKibben's The End of Nature, and Jared Diamond's Collapse. The message delivered by a great aridness is obviously the most important message of our time. If we get it, we may be saved, or at least we'll have a chance. If we don't get it, well, as Kurt Vonnegut used to say, so it goes. It's an honor to have William Du Bois with us tonight. Mercy. <laughs> so, anyhow, it is a great privilege to be here. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, in John's company, and, and, and wonderful to be introduced by him. I'm very grateful, John. Thank you. Uh, so that's the book, and, and I'm going to say just a couple of, you know, we're all tired of hearing about climate change, I think. Um, but here are the basic facts. This is, this is what should be a, an icon for all people in America, certainly all people in the world, too. This is the so-called Keeling Curve, David Keeling, a postdoc from... Caltech, uh, part of his doctorate was designing this wonderful machine to sample CO2 uh, in the atmosphere. He goes out to Mauna Loa uh, on the big island of Hawaii and sets it up and he starts recording this information. He starts back in 1958. CO2 was about 315 parts per million. The up and down, by the way, is one of his first discoveries. It's you could say it's the breathing in and breathing out of the planet. There's more CO2 in the atmosphere in the North American winter and less in the summer because most of the land mass is in North America, most of the land mass of the planet. And so when, when the vegetation in the Northern Hemisphere is leafed out, it sucks up a lot of CO2. And when it's not leafed out, it doesn't. So the CO2 is higher. Anyhow, Right away, Keeling noticed that CO2 was increasing, and my uh, partner, Joanna Hurley, and I were just out in Hawaii. We were on Mauna Loa. We, we went up to the research facility where, uh, these, where this curve was built, has been built since 1958, and I was able to look at the computer and see that the day's recordings were 392 parts per million, and it just keeps going up with 
this result, and this is a measure of global temperature averaged according to a very complicated algorithm developed at uh, a laboratory uh, that's part of, that's owned by NASA and part of Columbia University. And you can see that after about 1980, boy, that son of a gun really takes off. And what it bodes for our area is hot, hot, hot. Sorry, John. But um, hotter also means drier. And this is, this is from the fourth assessment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, uh, that came out in 2007 and won for the IPCC a, a co-Nobel Prize along with Al Gore for an inconvenient truth. Um, and at that time, according to the science at that time, the prediction for our region was basically an 8 degree Fahrenheit increase by the end of this century. Well, the models that produced that have proved to be really, really strong, as scientists like to say, very robust, um, except in one respect. And that is, and I'm just here to cheer you up, that is that the changes are happening faster than predicted because of lots of complicated little feedback loops that if we have some time for questions and answers, I'd be happy to go into with you. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking from slides. I'm going to read from the book. But this is the general situation that we're, we're warming up. And the sort of basic rule of thumb of climate change is that if you take the semi-closed system of Earth and you heat it up like that pot on the stove, what happens is that the system continues doing what it's always done, but it does more of it. More heat, more energy, more of the same stuff, only with more muscle. And one of the basic rules of thumb, then, is that wet places get wetter, dry places get drier. And one thing that, you know, kind of a second idiot's rule of global warming is that when the heat goes up, so does the dryness, because even if precipitation stays steady, more heat means more evaporation. So you have less surface water available. So flashing back, it's 2006. 2006, January, and I'm sitting in a hotel ballroom in Albuquerque, and a guy, a wonderful guy, I didn't know him at the time, he's introduced as Jonathan Overpeck. He's from the University of Arizona. Uh, and he's giving a talk. And he's a climatologist. He's talking about, he's talking about what climate change bodes for the Southwest. And he puts this map up on the screen. And I look at that son of a gun, and it wakes me from my daydreaming. I'm a very indifferent conference goer. I can't seem to pay attention to more than one presentation in a week. But I look up there, and I see that the Southwest is rather red, like an open sore. And I can tell that red means drier and less water. This is a map. This is a map, and this map is basically where the book of Great Aridness began. I was looking at this map. It took a while to decipher it. Anything that's colored means that the models agreed. More than two-thirds of the models agreed on the direction of change. Anything that's cross-hatched means that more than 90% of the models and model runs agreed. Okay. Um, so, basically, uh, what this is telling us, this is, a, this is a map of surface runoff. And what it's telling us is that the water available in the rivers and streams of the Southwest will likely decline by 10 to 30 percent, let's call it 20 percent, by mid-century.
So I looked at that and I thought, holy smokes, what's happening to my motherland? What's happening to the land that I love? And in that moment, I decided I really wanted to go out and find the guy who made this map and ask him how he made it. And what's the story behind it? And really, should I believe in it? So that's the first, first selection I want to read to you. And pardon me, it's a little, it starts off a little bit of nerdy science stuff. But hold tight. It'll humanize in a little bit. So here we go. When you build a model of the world's climate, you begin by chopping the atmosphere, the oceans, and the land surfaces of the planet into units. A perfect model would describe every point within the biosphere, but of course the number of possible points is infinite, and you would need an infinite amount of computer processing power to describe them. So you compromise. You divide the atmosphere and the oceans and the land surface into places as small as you can afford to get onto a computer. Where the atmosphere is concerned, this involves sectioning it vertically as well as horizontally. You have a column of air miles high doing different things at different altitudes. So you chop it all up into volumes that would look tiny from space, but that are gigantic from an earthly point of view. And then you begin to assign processes to each of the volumes, what happens thermodynamically with different levels of CO2 and other gases, and how that relates to temperature, wind, moisture transport, and other variables. You factor in the interrelationships among these variables over time and space, ramifying onward, potentially forever. And you express all this in terms of equations that are interdependent throughout the model. You also account for certain inputs, the amount of sunlight hitting Earth, which varies in luminosity, or volcanic eruptions, which change the concentrations of certain aerosols in the atmosphere. So then you have a whole mass of equations and you crank them forward. Basically, you're simulating things at the time scale of weather, usually in half hour steps. I've par paraphrased here what Chris Milley tried to teach me about the modeling work he pursues at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory outside Princeton, New Jersey. I don't think I was a very good student. Milley couldn't help couldn't, couldn't fail to notice the intermittent incomprehension in my eyes, but politely, generously, he pressed on. So there's thousands of equations for each 30-minute period that have to be solved. They're all coupled to each other, these big simultaneous equations. Yeah, you need big computers. So you put in all these equations and you solve them. We're in a small, sunlit room with child's paintings on one wall and a grease board crowded with the hieroglyphics of higher mathematics on another. Outside, a stiff fall wind is stripping the last leaves from the trees. The GFDL houses the kinds of supercomputers Millie is describing, powerful state-of-the-art machines worth uncounted millions of dollars and loaded with worlds of data. The computers themselves, let alone the fact that the facility set among groomed lawns in a handsome research park, is a federal in installation, prompt tight security for the lab. The facility belongs to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. It, is it has key-coded door locks in a secure glass-walled room next to the guard station where outsiders sign in. The architecture is corporate and the atmosphere almost martial, yet merely it epitomizes casualness. He's wearing jeans, running shoes, and a navy t-shirt with a breast pocket. The round lenses of his eyeglasses emphasize the arch of his eyebrows and lend him a quizzical air. He bears an expression of perpetual inquiry. He's been describing a eureka moment, a realization that came almost without warning and that fundamentally changed his skepticism about climate change. But the story about, of how it came about has required a number of digressions. The indecipherable scrawling on the grease board is a good reminder why that might be. The surprises in Chris Milley's professional life spring from a pretty rarefied context. For his story to make sense to a stranger, he has to reconstruct the context. 
Millie's an exception at the GFDO. He doesn't work for NOAA, but is a senior researcher with the U.S. Geological Survey, posted at the NOAA site to create crossover connections. NOAA does air and the oceans. USGS does land. It makes sense to pull the elements together. Millie explained that he, he's neither an atmospheric scientist nor a climatologist, as though these were lamentable limitations. He was almost apologetic when he said, I can't show you the equations for potential vorticity. Rather, he's a hydrologist. His forte is describing processes that take place on terra firma. And what he particularly brings to the research group he leads is an instinct for connecting the hydrological dynamics of the land to the dynamics of sea and air. Millie and his team decided to test the hypothesis offered a few pages back that the water cycle intensifies as Earth warms. That's basically wet places get wet. Because everything's warmer, the atmosphere can hold more vapor, and therefore there's a lot of water just moving around, and therefore all the water fluxes in the world get bigger. Precipitation and fire evaporation runoff. He pauses to let this sink in. That's not a bad zero-order characterization, but it's overly simplistic. And there's no reason to go by that anyway, because we do have the models that have much more structure and much more detail spatially, too. So we can look at what they say, and that's what we did. In the fourth assessment report, IPCC scientists ran their models chiefly to generate outputs of temperature and precipitation. Although, although the models simulated runoff, which Millie describes as, quote, the water that the land has left over after it's gotten its precip precipitation and kind of <coughs> wrestled with the atmosphere over evaporation, nobody had taken a serious look at it. So we took those outputs from all these models there were 21 of them, and we did some ensembling, which is just trying to combine the results of many different models to get one best estimate. Then we looked at what this ensemble model said about what one might have expected to see happen globally during the 20th century, i.e. in the past. To very verify the model, he and his group also set about obtaining actual stream flow measurements for, for major rivers around the globe. Fortunately, there's a central repository for such information. You get all these records of Mississippi and Vicksburg and so forth, actual his historical observations for the Ganges, the Euphrates, the Nile, the Zambezi, Zambezi, the Orinoco, and scores more. And then, quote, you go into the models and make the observations at the same times and places in the models as where you have observations. Billy is gesturing as though the models are in one hand and the first hand's 20th century river measurements are in the other. He brings his hands together, touching fingertips. It's just a one-to-one -one correspondence between nature and the model. So you're not comparing apples and oranges. You're comparing simulated apples to observed apples. The team mapped both sets of outputs and colored them to show where things got wetter and where they got drier. Finally, Millie and the others had a look at them, side by side. Quote, The first time I saw those two together, that was that eureka moment. There was this feeling inside. You were valid, validated. Oh my gosh. The correspondence between these maps was just too striking, at least subjectively at first. I mean, you have to do rigorous statistics to say whether, well, that could have just happened by chance. But the first impression upon seeing that was, wow, because there just appeared to be too much correspondence to be explained by random variability. The implication of the correspondence between the actual observed data and the output from the models was that the major 20th century regional patterns, things like the ups and downs of precipitation, the drying in the Sahel, the increasing wetness in the eastern United States were not random. Rather, they were largely the result of forces that drive global climate, varying levels of solar radiation, changes in greenhouse gases, and other climate-altering factors. Randomness is the default assumption that hydrologists like Millie are trained to make, that it's just natural variability. It's just 
bouncing around. If they want to be taken seriously as scientists, they have to be skeptics about causes of a higher order. Quote, so my biggest surprise was seeing that and seeing the success of the models that my colleagues had built and improved over the years, seeing a success in quantifying a variable that they had never looked at. They never tried to tune the models to get the hydrology right, per se, other than having precipitation in the tropics and no precipitation in the deserts. Milley had been a self-described doubter on matters pertaining to climate change, not a disbeliever, but cautious, wondering whether more was claimed for the phenomenon than facts would support. Appropriately so, I think. That's the sort of background that I come from, just highly skeptical of any violation of the null hypothesis. There's nothing there. Don't get too excited. But then came the two maps and the unignorable correspondence between real-world data and model simulations. Quote, the modelers were looking at other things, but this fell out of it, and it looked like the pattern of what happened in the world. We subsequently did all kinds of statistical analyses, run the models with no forcing at all for scale of climate. It's easy to get constant climate in a model. You just turn off all those exogenous things that make climate change. You look at many, many different climate sim simulations. Do any of them develop patterns just by chance that look as similar to the observations as did the forced example? And none of them did. They just couldn't generate that. So it makes a pretty strong case for externals forcing, causing major variations in hydrology. If the models were good at describing the past, it stood to reason that their description of the future deserved attention. But this doesn't, this doesn't suddenly say, hey, the models are right, but it lends credence. It enhances their believability. It makes you take them a bit more seriously. And so Milley and his group ran model simulations of global hydrology forward to see what might be likely to happen, assuming no unforeseen developments, asteroid impacts, major volcanic eruptions, or a global economic meltdown that turns off the engines of industry. They published the, the, the results in Nature in 2005. They considered two factors in particular, the first being the degree of agreement among 21 models, running some of them multiple times, because different in initial conditions yield different results. They wanted to see how well the models agreed on the direction of change for a given region, whether it would get wetter or drier. They figured that the more the models agreed, the more their predictions deserved credence. The second factor was the amount of change the models predicted. How much did the stream flow in a given region, how much the stream flow in a given region would increase or decrease? The Southwest comes out as one of the big losers. More than two-thirds of the model runs agreed that the region would become substantially drier, and for some sub-regions within the Southwest, over 90% of the models agreed. The amount of drying predicted for the mid-21st century was generally in the range of 10 to 30 percent relative to a baseline calculated from the period 1900 to 1970. Put simply, the models were suggesting that the region would have available to it about a fifth less water than had been the case during most of the 20th century, even including its droughts. And as the century progressed, things would keep getting worse. This was not good news for an already overtapped region that suffered, as one wag has put it, not so much from a shortage of water as from a longage of people. And more people are arriving all the time. I remember the first time I saw the maps from Chris Milley's article. It was at a conference in January 2006, not long after the article appeared. Jonathan Overpeck was speaking. I'm an indifferent conference attender, short in attention, quick to daydream. I'd been in the hallway chatting with friends when Overpeck began, but then the hallway emptied. Overpeck was well into his presentation when I finally slipped into a chair at the back of the room and thumbed through my program to learn who he was. I expected to settle into a restful 30 minutes of dozing. Then Overpeck put one of Millie's maps on the screen. The Southwest was as red as an open sore. So was a band that stretched across northern Africa, the Mediterranean basin, 
the Middle East and deep into Central Asia, high agreement among the models over, over Peck said. And the models agreed that surface water availability, the blood of the oasis civilization of the Southwest and all those other arid and semi-arid regions would substantially, perhaps precipitously, decline. In a sense, this book was born at that moment, although I did not know it at the time. The room was still, no shuffling, no coughing. I remember the colors of the room, the design of the chair in front of me, the texture of the cushions. I felt cold. I tried to remember a statistic I had cited in something I had written. How many people relied on the Colorado River for all or part of their water, more or less currently, and how many would do so in the near future? I've since looked the numbers up. 23 million people dependent on the Colorado in 1996. 38 million projected for 2020. It's widely known that the Colorado is already dangerously overallocated. If its water yield were to decline, let's say, 20%, or even just 10%, what would be the effect on the lives and livelihoods of 38 million Mexicans and Americans? And if you made a similar calculation for the overtaxed Rio Grande, beside which lie several million more Americans and Mexicans in uneasy codependence, and if you factored in thousands of other communities scattered through the region that rely on sources of water less secure than either of those two big rivers, well then, the trouble we were in was of a scale to match the giant, sprawling, brown, brawny southwest itself. There's another very striking pair of maps I could show you, Chris Milley said. Again, he gestured with both hands, one hand as though holding the first map. When you look at the reds and blues of the 2005 map, where the big drying patterns and the big wetting patterns are projected, that's one map. Then the other hand outstretched. I can show you another map, which is a map of the water stress regions of the world. Again, the hands come together, fingertips to fingertips. This map of water stressed regions is like one to one compared to the map of projected drying. He hypothesized that in the dry regions of the globe, human population and activity inexorably expand until they approach the maximum the system can accommodate. So human water scarcity naturally correlates with climatic water scarcity. It sounds like the law of closets I offered, that however much space you have, you fill it up. Yeah, that's true. Or the Peter principle that people rise to their level of incompetence, kind of the same idea. But it was a grim idea that not just in the southwest alone, but in regions throughout the world, the areas most likely to experience a decline in available water are those least able to withstand it. Milley explained that it was not merely a question of drug, which semantically suggests an impermanent condition. He was saying what Richard Sager and Jonathan Overpeck, each in his own way, had also said, that for the water stress regions of the world, including the North American Southwest, normal was downshifting, and it was downshifting a lot. Then he was silent, waiting for me to ask another question. He'd made his point. World society was going to weaken at one of its most weakened, weakest points. Hundreds of millions of people live in the water-stressed regions of the world. Their situation's endlessly variable, but their dependence on a scarce resource uniting them in unwanted vulnerability. Unfortunately, their unity of condition breeds a division of interests as communities and nations compete for precious water, sometimes violently. One of the reddest regions on Millie's map, which is to say one of the portions of the planet most threatened by a decline in water supply, stretches from Lebanon and Israel through Iraq and Iran to Afghanistan lands beset by generations of intense conflict where the stress of water shortage can inflame old grudges. The downshifting lands of North America have seen their share of conflict too, and more seems on the way, presaged by the hundreds of miles of border wall the United States has built and the tens of thousands of border police 
it's employed to enforce the separation of its arid lands from the arid lands of Mexico. The maps we stared at said that the screws of want and thirst in these regions would only tighten. Millie and I sat in silence for an awkwardly long time. There was nothing more to say without saying too little or too much. Finally, I broke the silence and asked another question. It was not an important question. It was just another on my list. So that's a downer, isn't it? <laughs> I want to read something a little bit more up. I could read more from A Great Aridness, but I'm afraid I will. Um, uh, I was going to read something about the border and all the sorrow associated with it. I'll just show you. If you ever get to Nogales, Anybody know? Do you all know where Nogales is? It's, you know, if you're going, going to Mexico from Tucson, you probably go through Nogales. And uh, there's a U.S. Nogales and there's a Mexico Nogales. And if you cross in the in the old border uh, uh, post down in the valley where the walnut trees used to grow, that's what Nogal means. Is walnut Nogales a place of walnut? Anyhow, if you if you if you walk through the border down there, and as soon as you're in Mexico, take a hard right and walk up the way, you see incredible art on the border wall on the Mexico side for a kilometer or so. It's amazing. It's sort of like what would have happened if you were an East German and you walked through Checkpoint Charlie in the border, in the Berlin, in, in, in the Berlin Wall and walked up that wall. It was covered with all kinds of uh, painted on art. Of course, on the communist side and on the United States side, there's no painting on the wall. We don't approve of that. But anyhow, there's a kilometer or more, or more of really good art. And, and this one particularly took me, it's a, it's a mosaic of moving feet. And it's composed of individual photographs of individual people who've made the journey. I spent time uh, working on a great aridness down there on the border. I, my guides were basically these people. Uh, Krista Sadler, an old friend, a river guide from the Colorado River. Bill Older, Odell, a, uh, an ex-Marine. Actually, there's no such thing as an ex-Marine, a retired Marine, uh, who lives right down there on the border. Uh, the, the wall was erected basically in his, his front yard. Uh, this is the San Pedro River running through the border. The, the wires there are the border right there at the river. Um, and of course the wall stretches on. This is right in front of Odell's place. He said of the border wall, you know, it's ugly. When the wind blows, it makes a horrible noise. Uh, it costs way too much and it doesn't work. That's how you know it's a federal project. <laughs> the guy up in the corner there is a fellow named Dan Millis. He was a high school teacher. Uh, but he became moved by the plight of the, of the migrantes, the, the Mexicanos and the Central Americans coming across the border. And he volunteered much of his time to a group called No More Deaths. He was... Uh, on patrol for no more deaths uh, some years ago, how many years ago, about uh, 2009, I guess, 2008 or 9, uh, delivering water to a, to a station out in the desert south of Aravaca where thirsty migrantes might uh, be able to get a life-saving drink of water when he came across uh, a dead body. It belonged to a 14-year-old El Salvadoran girl, Joselin, Joselina, and this is the uh, memorial made to her. One of the theses of a great aridness is that the strains of climate change are going to cause movement along all the, basically, the fault lines of southwestern society. And, uh, you could argue that the mother of all fault lines in the Southwest is this 
international border running across uh, the southwest. Uh, already in the border area, more migrantes have died than all the U.S. service people in, in Iraq and Afghanistan put together. So think about that. I mean, it's not a war along the border, but the consequences um, are like a war for those people. And U.S. policy actually is to move the, the movement of migrantes always farther and farther out into more extreme environments to shut down movement of migrantes through the cities and push them out into the desert. And the Clinton administration was believed that people wouldn't go out into the desert like that. In fact, what happened is people did go out into the desert uh, and they risked and all too frequently lost their lives. But I'm not well, if anybody has the strength for a question, I'd be happy to try to answer them on, on uh, um, a great aridness, climate change, you name it. Uh, feel free to wing away if you... Yes, please. Uh, I noticed on that map that Wyoming was uh, not colored, whereas Montana was, and uh, Colorado um, has the hatches. Um, and I know that the green comes out of Wyoming, northern Wyoming. And, yeah. And it's a big part, I mean, <clears throat> it's a big part of the Colorado. In fact, they said that it should. The Colorado should have been named the Green. Yeah. And uh, so I just was curious about that. Um, what what does that say for Wyoming versus Idaho or Montana or Colorado? Well, in in this particular map, this particular instance, uh, being white just means that less than sixty six percent of the model runs agreed on the direction of change, wetter or drier. So I don't know anything more about what was predicted for uh, Wyoming or how close to a 66% consensus there was. But you raise a really interesting point about the Colorado River and, and, and the green uh, in that um, you know, we have basically a bimodal weather system in the west. If we're dry in the southwest, the, the northern Rockies tend to be wet. And vice versa, if the northern Rockies are dry, we tend to, to be uh, wet down here. Um, so the Colorado is a big enough system that it reaches up there into that system. And, and last year, which was bone dry in the southwest, setting new records uh, from Texas all the way to California, um, the northern Rockies were very, had a great winter, had a very snowy winter. Um, so it's complicated talking about the Colorado because it can share from both of these systems, but if the, if the whole system moves north, which is a possibility, then we lose that bimodality and we lose a lot of the resilience in the southwest, if that makes any sense. Yes. Well, I'm a little confused about what's actually being measured because it says annual runoff. It doesn't say rainfall. No, it's not rainfall. This is this is uh, surface water, I which is to say, that's, that's at, this 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 model is looking at what happens after the rain and snow have fallen and after evaporation has taken its tithe, and how much water then will be in the rivers and the lakes. And most of our water system depend water systems depend on surface flow like this in the southwest, river flow and lakes. Does that make sense? Or? Well, it makes a little bit of sense, yeah. It just seems like an odd thing to, to measure. Well, in a way, it's much more useful than measuring precipitation. I just don't know how they can measure it. Well, it's a big complicated model and it, it you know, I'm the last
last person in the world who would be able to explain to you what all the equations in these models do. But basically, the equations in this model are taking precipitation, projected pre precipitation, and subtracting from that anticipated evaporation based on temperature and giving us what's left. And what's left is what we get to use. So in a sense, this is a more useful uh, prediction than precipitation alone. Yes, sir. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you very much for the wonderful reads. Very informative. I appreciate that. Thank you. And, and for being a, a voice, a, a literary voice, to <clears throat> constantly getting the word out there to the public and to the world for what we're bombarded with in the contrary through a lot of the media. And, and the voice that I hear is one of, of uh, solid research and, um, and it's out there now and I'm really happy for that. My question is the, the indigo, the balloon, mm -hmm. uh, must, I guess, result in the melt off of glaciers and ice islands? You know, that's a really good question. I'm, I, I presume that glacial melt, the, 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 the melting of stored water, is part of the runoff model. But at the same time, I believe that the models are saying that precipitation is going to increase in those blue areas and result in more runoff too. Uh, you know, the glaciers would apply, glacial melting would apply to in the, primarily in the far north. Um, but it's in there, yeah. <coughs> yes, sir. Um, I know, uh, you know, you weren't able to wrap your head around everything I'm sure, but you, I'm sure you know more than most people. So I was just wondering as you, as you looked at the map and did your research, um, what were some of the wild cards and possibilities as far as um, possible changes to just the weather patterns? Like, you know, the jet stream tends to do a certain thing, the monsoon kind of does a certain thing, but I mean, is there a potential for like a, a shift, a permanent shift in the jet stream, or, or perhaps even maybe drier winters, but wetter yeah. the summers? Or? Yeah, in fact, uh, hold on, just say while well, I grab a pointer. <laughs> so one of the one of the things uh, I mentioned is that this, this climate system with more heat in it has more energy, so more oomph. Okay, so it's going to do the stuff it's always done, but with more power. And so one of the things that affects us here is this called the Hadley cell. Most of you know the equator gets more heat than any other part more solar radiation than any other part of Earth. So there's an up, up movement of air. Heated air rises. It rises with a lot of water in it um, because it has a lot of water holding capacity. It cools as it goes up and, and it loses its water. That's why the tropics are so rainy. And that air hits the bottom of the stratosphere and it moves toward the poles. And now it's dry, and it's cold, but it comes back down to Earth basically near 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. Okay, this is the Hadley cell circulation. When it comes down, coming down, it compresses, which makes it hotter, and it's dry. So this downwelling dry, hot air accounts for the fact that most of the deserts of the world, if you look at a map, I can show you another slide, but it take a while to find it. Um, most of the deserts of the world are along 30 north and 30 south. Okay, so now we get more oomph in the climate system. The Earth does more of what it's always been doing. So this circulation becomes more muscular and it expands. So instead of the Hadley cell descending, downwelling, centered on 30 north, maybe it moves to descend on 32 north, or 33 north, or where are we right here, 34, 36 north, anybody know? 36. 36. 
So that's one of the one of the the changes that could affect our weather, and this zone of downwelling can become a barrier to winter storms coming off the Aleutians, off the North Pacific, which accounts for most of our winter snow in northern New Mexico. So if this downwelling cell moves north, and that creates more of a barrier to the kind of weather we're dependent on here for the water that we can store. And that water we can store is what falls as snow and stays cold at high elevation and runs off more slowly during the summer. So that's one of the, the tricky big things for us here. Of course, we don't know really much of anything about how these changes may affect ocean currents. And, and those are the, the kind of key things for global weather. Um, one of the, one, one um, subject, map, subject being debated right now, there's some belief, some understanding that melting of the Arctic <coughs> snowpack, which is very, very advanced, there's a lot less Arctic ice now than there was, say, 15, 20 years ago, accounts for this incredible cold weather uh, that has just afflicted Europe because dot, 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 all this stuff has happened. Basically, a high pressure system is set up over, over northern Europe that hasn't allowed warm weather to come in, and that could be related to the melting of Arctic snow, of the Arctic ice pack. So there are all these things out there that can grab us pretty hard. Is there any chance that the, <clears throat> the overall hotter temperatures, especially in the summer, would possibly bring us more summer moisture to prevent like complete forest and deforestation? That's a really good question. And, and the, the effect of higher temperatures on the monsoons, or what we call monsoons here, possibly inaccurately, uh, is really not understood well at all. But the fact is that during the summer, because of our heat and aridity, the southwest is a net exporter of moisture. During the winter, we're a net importer of moisture. So even if the summer monsoons become more abundant, that may be moisture that we can't hold on to because it'll just go back in more evaporation and also because it doesn't store as well. We just have so many reservoirs and so many reservoir opportunities. Actually, there's another side to this that I should mention, and that is with this more muscular climate system, then we can expect a lot more extreme events. So that in the same year, you might have record drought and record summer rain, producing floods, record floods. In the same year, you might have record cold and record hot. The highs are going to be higher, the lows are going to be lower. We probably, in this part of the world, can expect more arroyo cutting, more, more flash floods, more transformation of the topography of the land as part of this patch. Yes, ma'am. Uh, looking at that map, I'm, I'm seeing um, that this whole idea this of, map? Yeah, of water as a commodity. And, um, you know, you can see the areas where there's going to be maybe more water and versus less water. And I wondered if you could address that as far as that eventually water is going to be the commodity, not oil. Well, you know, it, that's been on the table for a while that, that, you know, there are wars about oil now. I'm afraid there are going to be wars about oil for a long time, but there are also going to be wars about water. And frankly, the, the water scarcity uh, in places all along here, and maybe here. Well, water scarcity in northern Mexico, there's some people who say that you know, we, we can expect more people moving north across the border as, as Mexico tends to dry out. We're going to have a hard time here in, this, in the U.S. Southwest, but Mexico is already very hard hit and, and uh, has um, relatively poor prospects with climate change for a number of reasons. But um, 
this kind of drying out is going to put populations in motion. And it won't necessarily be fighting over water, but it will be fighting over what people do when they have to move, when they have to cross borders, when they have to struggle and, and fight for subsistence in a new place. Already, you know, Spain is very concerned about migration from my Morocco. Egypt is worried about people coming up from the Sahel. Uh, India is building a wall against Bangladesh. Um, it's not just drought, but it's going to be the changes in, in climate in the terms of existence uh, in one region after another that set populations in motion. It's for this reason that the CIA, back during the uh, lamentable Bush administration, declared that climate change was a national security issue. Of course, the Bush White House was deaf to that, but the CIA went on record there. And they're not exactly known as being humanists. They're just <laughs> looking at the bald facts of the matter. Yes, sir? There was on this point, there was a report out about two or three years ago from the World Bank saying that they were projecting that by 2050 there would be more water refugees than conflict refugees. Is that right? Interesting. Well, that fits the pattern, doesn't it? Joanna? Yeah, question. Um, talking about um, migration across the border and, um, and climate change, and it's like, I'd love it if you could talk a little bit more about the cause and effect of that. Well, again, I think um, climate change is going to put great stress on societies. Here's here's one of the here, here, here's one of the takeaways. I'm glad you brought that up because um, many of you probably have read Rebecca Solnit. She's a terrific writer. Um, she wrote a book about the San Francisco earthquake of what was it, 1906, um, and other disasters. And her thesis was that sudden disasters like earthquakes, big fights, Chicago Fire. Um, floods, things like that, bring people together, even if temporarily. If you think about it, it makes sense. Suddenly, rich and poor, everybody, there's an equality of condition. Everybody's in the same difficult boat. And so those kinds of sudden disasters breed a sense of human community, not drought. Think about drought. When it starts, you don't know it's starting until you're way into it already. Oh, let's see. So here's here's last summer's Las Conchas fire. Um, drought works a different way. When drought happens, um, you don't know it's begun until you're already well into it. You never have any idea when it's going to end. So it lasts, and it lasts, and it grinds you down, and it gives you plenty of time to meditate on all the deficiencies of your neighbors. <laughs> you get to think about how really they were wrong about so many things, and that they really should have done it differently. Drought tends to divide people, to push them apart. That's one of the reasons that increasing aridity in an overtapped region like ours can produce these really difficult kinds of tensions. And of course, the, the international border, right now things are calmer than they have been, not because the border wall is particularly affected, not because the Border Patrol is now the largest armed police force in the United States, bigger than the FBI. Um, it's, it's calmer there because our recession has meant fewer jobs up here, so fewer people are trying to come north. Uh, unfortunately, because of the difficulties of crossing the border, now fewer people are also going south and rejoining with their families and, and uh, enjoying their hometowns and things like that. We've stopped the circularity of the border movement. When the re economy revives and as the the screws of drought 
tightened. We're going to see more movement along the border again, and we'll probably see more proto-Nazi behavior like that which you see in the Arizona immigration law and that which you see practiced by Sheriff Joe Arpaio of Maricopa County, etc. Um, so this is one of the great weaknesses of the, of the Southwest, and we're going to see that weakness probably get weaker. John, did you have something? Yeah, do you, did you ever find out what kind of a bird was saying who's there? Yeah, I still haven't figured that out. And I, I thought I was a pretty good birder, but, you know, I, I think it was there just to kick me in the ass and help me write that piece. By the way, the, 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 the writer, um, the, the, the mentor who you know, told me just go out to New Mexico and be like John Nichols. Also, somewhere along the line, I don't know if you've ever come across this, but he, he said, if you ever want to just increase the emotional intensity of, of a scene a little bit, he said, just make it rain. <laughs> Add rain. Yeah, so anyhow, in that scene that I read, I, I added rain. It wasn't there in, in real life. <laughs> I, mean, I was, you know, that was creative nonfiction, you know, license to lie. Uh, okay. Yes, sir. Has anyone used this information to project where the food growing areas in the world are going to move to? Oh, that's a really good question. You know, the, 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 uh, the climate deniers are very, you, you read their stuff and they're very blasé about, oh, no sweat, you just, you know, grow wheat a little farther north and you grow this a little farther north and everything will be fine. Well, you know, there are things like soil type and water availability and other matters to consider. And, and so I think that there have been some studies along these lines, but the... The, the, the picture is so complicated, there are many variables that run through it, and it's really hard to crank out much of an answer. Um, when things really begin to change, I don't think you can expect adaptation necessarily to be systematic. Um, in a situation like that, we're probably going to see more of just chaos and dumb luck. I'd like to say, you know, no sweat, it's going to harden up, but I'm not sure that's the case. Yeah, go ahead. Do you think population control is the most important thing that we can do now? You know, I don't, actually. I think that um, organizing our communities to agree, A, on the facts of the matter, and then on a, on a reasonable uh, approach to resilience, uh, a strategy for achieving resilience, probably makes more sense. Uh, population is a big factor. Certainly, if if uh, everybody in the world is going to try to live like Americans, but if Americans started living like the people in Laos, shoot, we could accommodate a whole lot more people than we already have. So it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily, the, I mean, the number of people is important. Don't get me wrong. Population is very important. But it's really the, the, the resource appetite that uh, is more important. I mean, one American weighs more on the planet than probably 50 Lao. Well, you all have been great. Thank you so much for having me here. And thank you, John and John.